Um, hello everyone, um, so we're lucky enough today to have um, Ellis from Riku, who's going to be presenting, and then we've got Craig and uh, James um, in the background from Riku, um, who will answer any, any questions that are dropped in, into the chat. Um, also, Ellis will pause after each one of his sections um, to, to take any questions, so please, please ask questions um, if you have any, and if you can, um, it's nice, I'm sure for Ellis, a few of us have our cameras on so he knows he's not um, <laughs> talking uh, to himself. And so yes, yeah, so we're here today to talk about wastewater, wastewater heat recovery. Um, and uh, I suppose, I think I think this is great. I mean, I, I genuinely love the idea that, you know, we should be capturing all the waste that, that leaves our building. So we've been doing um, MVHR systems for quite a long time to capture um, the waste heat in our ventilation system. And of, and of course, um, the, the wastewater heat recovery to, to capture waste. Um, the heat in our wastewater, and I was I was just saying to Ellis there that um, I have I have a wastewater heat recovery device in my house, so I can absolutely testify to how uh, um, cool it is when you're if you're having a shower and you you put your hand on the, the cold feed to your shower and you start to feel that cold feed warm up, um, and knowing that all that all that energy would have otherwise just been um, pouring down your drain is is quite is quite fun, especially if you're a, a nerdy <laughs> engineer. Okay, so. Um, I'll, just, I'll just hand over to Ellis to, uh, to take it away. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks, uh, thanks to everybody for, for joining today. So, yeah, as, um, as I said, we'll run through essentially a, an overview on wastewater heat recovery in, in, uh, in basic terms on how it works, um, a look at um, the, the recoup products. Um, now, obviously, we, we, we have a number of products, but they're, they're similar to others that are on the market. So vertical systems, horizontal systems, uh, what, what they are, what they do, and, and the scenarios that they're used for. Um, and then a look at uh, wastewater heat recovery and, and essentially how it fits into, into Part L 2021. Um, this uh, presentation is uh, Part L 2020, wastewater heat recovery for Part L 21 for new build housing. Um, so that, that's the main thing. So we'll cover a little bit of design in for a standard house type and also for an apartment and look at the kind of impact um, that wastewater heat recovery can have in SAP. And then hopefully we'll have some time for um, a, a couple of case studies. Um, I've got a, a standard case study looking at um, a, a, a more uh, forward-looking uh, house type from Barrett, um, but also I've um, dropped in a couple of uh, Max Fordham specific projects. So hopefully that will ring true with a couple of you here. And then um, I do also have loaded up at the back. I don't think we'll have time in the standard hour, but I do have some other case studies for non-residential. So uh, hotels, student accommodation and um, uh, um, sports centres. So, if anybody wants to stay on or just have a dis you know, discussion or questions afterwards, then then feel free. So, who uses wastewater heat recovery? Well, in in the UK, uh, it is mainly used for new build housing, uh, driven by Part L compliance. Uh, historically, uh, Part L twenty thirteen was the, the the last incarnation of regs, and wastewater heat recovery, whilst not used as standard spec by house builders, it was used often to help achieve. Um, local uplift over over Part L regulation. So more on a, on a uh, development by development, maybe uh, London plan using that sort of thing. Um, but as well as new build housing, we do have products that are suitable for apartments, for bungalows, for passive house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but in addition to uh, house building, with the new Part L regulations coming into play for residential, we're also seeing the same for non-residential, and we're seeing a much much bigger uplift, uh, certainly for hotel and student accommodation new build. Um, the last couple of years, we've, we've got a really big pipeline of, of projects we're supporting there, um, as well as uh, sports and leisure facilities. So anywhere essentially where there's showers and, and especially showers with high use can really benefit from wastewater heat recovery. So uh, again, case studies there for, for um, sort of gyms and swimming pools, etc. Um, and then looking forward, the big expectation is for, for a much bigger uplift in terms of uh, use in housing stock upgrades and domestic retrofit. Um, today, domestic retrofit tends to be driven by um, funding uh, and funding, the, the main funding mechanism is, is ECO. Uh, the current incarnation, ECO4, has about £6.4 billion uh, pounds worth of funding. Currently, uh, only available for space heating uh, and, and, and heating upgrades. But the expectation is that this year, if not early next year, that scope will be widened to allow for um, non-space heating measures. And the expectation is that, that wastewater heat recovery really could be 
the low hanging fruit there, the, 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 the new loft insulation, if you like, from Retrofit. So we're uh, poised and got our eyes on that. Um, so why use wastewater heat recovery? Well, um, it offers significant energy and carbon reductions. Um, it's, it's a very simple heat exchanger system that quite simply, as Andrew said on the intro, it takes the uh, heat energy from the outgoing warm shower waste and transfers that and imparts it into the incoming cold water main. So it really is as simple as that, but it does give um, significant uh, energy savings and, 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 and CO2 impact, which we'll look at as we go through. Um, it offers simple cost-effective Part L compliance and nobody likes to think of their product as a, as a box ticker, but the reality as, is that this ticks the box very, very well in terms of Part L compliance for very little installed cost. So high SAP points, low installed cost. Um, but also it, it impacts hot water. So um, it can have a, a, a significant impact on, on hot water use. So the, um, our standard uh, wastewater heat recovery pipe installed as a, um, a primary uh, unit onto a, a master ensuite, for example, you would expect that to reduce the amount of energy used per shower by about 55%. So it really is significant. Um, so either less hot water per shower or, or and or um, less uh, energy required to produce hot water. And we'll kind of dive into how that works in a, in a moment. Um, importantly though, no end user interaction required. So um, wastewater heat recovery, it, it's a heat exchanger. It's got no moving or mechanical parts, no electrical connections, no filters, no consumables. It just works every time the shower is switched on. It's passive, it's instantaneous, it's fit and forget. So uh, in terms of end user, there's no um, uh, end user experience or, 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 or reduction in their, in their showering experience. It's exactly the same showering experience with or without wastewater heat recovery. Um, very easy to design in and we'll, we'll go through some design and case studies towards the end, but essentially it, it takes up very little space, easy to design into existing house types. As I said, fit and forget, maintenance fit, uh, planned maintenance free, um, and has a very long working lifespan. So um, bays have attributed a 40 to 60 year lifespan on the uh, vertical pipe systems and on the horizontal systems they've attributed a 25 year working lifespan. So if you consider that uh, or compare that sort of against boilers or air source heat pumps and other technologies, it really is a much, much longer working lifespan in line with the plumbing infrastructure. And then for lo those of you looking towards um, sort of SAP 11 or uh, uh, projects with embodied carbon, whole life, uh, whole life cycle carbon projects, uh, wastewater heat recovery has a very low embodied carbon score, um, which we can, I'll uh, show a couple of slides on our TM65 score at the end there. Um, just uh, in case, hopefully you can see me properly, just a quick reminder, if you look at the three dots at the bottom left next to my name, there's a fit to frame. If you're having trouble seeing the whole screen, then just please click the fit to frame. That should uh, sort things out for you. Um, so I'm just going to, a quick uh, animation just showing how wastewater heat recovery works. As I said, we've got a number of products in the portfolio, but generally for new build housing, it's the vertical pipe system that we would be looking to specify. So that's the one that we'll sort of focus on now. Um, so just as this loads up, um, wastewater heat recovery, heat exchanger, uh, SAP listed, but to um, be compliant with SAP or with um, uh, SAP compliant, it requires uh, a thermostatic shower mixer. So um, the, the reason being is when you shower with a thermostatic mixer, it will maintain flow rate, but it can adjust the ratio of hot to cold in the background. And that's how we get our energy savings ultimately. So um, what we're looking at here, as you can see, hopefully my, where's my cursor? There we go. Um, so we've got the wastewater heat recovery pipe located on the, on the floor below the shower it's connected to. It's gravity fed on the waste side. So what you will see in a moment is uh, when the shower would normally start up without wastewater heat recovery, your thermostatic mixer will be receiving uh, hot and cold water, um, cold incoming main temperature around about 10 or 12 degrees. And so you'll have about 50% uh, incoming cold water and about 50% generated hot water at about 55, 60 degrees to give a comfortable 41 degrees or so uh, shower temperature. Of that 41 degrees coming out of the shower head, about 85 to 90% of the heat energy would normally go down the drain and be lost out of the building. So there's potentially a lot of heat energy locked up in that shower water. So what we do, we uh, um, basically put a, a heat exchanger on the outgoing shower waste. So in this case, the vertical pipe, but it's, it's the same principle for always for the heat recovery. Um, and so the, the, the heat exchanger goes on the, on the outgoing shower waste. So that drops down through the middle or the inside of the pipe 
at the same time as the shower is switched on, uh, cold water will be drawn through the system, through the pipe, and then that will come out and be preheated. So if we've got an incoming cold water temperature of around about 10 or 12 degrees, we would normally expect around about a 25 to 28 degree preheated water temperature. So that's a, a, a free energy uplift from uh, of around 15 to 18 degrees. So really is quite significant. And that's, that's the basic premise of wastewater heat recovery. It really is that simple. However, um, for SAP uh, and SBEM modeling, there are three recognized installation methods. Uh, system A, which is the most efficient, System B and System C. So we're showing System A here and I'll just switch across to uh, another, a still slide um, just so you can see. So what we've got, we've got that cold water going through, coming up preheated. For System A, it's simply how we pipe up the, the preheat. So what we're looking at here is the preheat is feeding the cold side of the shower uh, and it's feeding the hot water source, whatever that may be. Um, so by sending preheat to the, uh, the cold side of the shower, the thermostatic mixer will now in the background adjust the ratio of hot to cold in favour of the more free issue cold or in this case the preheated side. So instead of that 50-50 mix that we start with, it will move to around about a 70-30. So immediately you're using less hot water per shower, but also then by teeing off and sending that uh, preheated water to feed the hot water source, um, wastewater heat recovery is technology agnostic as long as it can, um, your hot water source can take a preheated uh, cold feed, uh, we're, we're absolutely golden. So uh, it could be a cylinder, could be a combi boiler, could be a heat interface unit, could be an air source heat pump, could be a microwave boiler or whatever other technologies might be coming through. As long as it can accept a preheated cold water source, we will make energy savings there. So uh, by sending the, the, the warmed water to, for instance, a cylinder, your boiler is now, instead of working and heating from 10 up to 60, it's heating from, uh, from 25, 28 up to 60. So we use less hot water per shower on one side and the hot water we're generating is generated more efficiently on the other side. So that's system A. System A is normally used um, where, on, on a primary shower in a new build home. So as we're showing here, you might expect um, the ensuite shower uh, to have a, a pipe installed as system A that will maximize your energy savings. Um, however, if there are more than one shower um, or if there's uh, long pipe runs and, and, and big buildings, you may want to consider system B. So system B will be used for any secondary showers in a, in a, in a residential. Uh, almost invariably system B is used for non-residential when you've got multiple showers um, and centralized hot water plant. Um, and quite simply, system B just sends that preheat to the cold side of the shower only. So we're using less hot water per shower. But you'll notice here, this is completely isolated from the hot water cylinder or, or the hot water system. So it, it, it's closed circuit and that's why it can be used on multiple wastewater heat recovery shower, uh, units when you've got centralized hot water plants. So it doesn't interfere with a hot water plant at all. Um, and then just for completeness, system C is where we send the preheat just to the hot water source. Um, rarely see this in non-residential projects, um, but in residential, if you imagine you've got a townhouse scenario where maybe you've got a, a second floor shower stacked above the first floor shower, the pipe would locate on the ground floor, perhaps in the utility room or something, and then the waste from both showers can drop into the pipe. And rather than have to pipe up all the way up through two floors, quite simply pipe back to the hot water source, which may again be a cylinder in a utility room or a boiler in the utility room. Um, and that will reduce the amount of pipe work, but it maximizes the impact because you've got two showers going into one pipe. So um, system C sits between system A and B, um, but really it's mainly A and B that's used. Um, just to qualify those savings, um, what we're looking at here is um, stand, oh, the, 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 the old um, uh, part L default for showering was 11 liters per minute. So as you can see here, the heat recovery efficiency of the pipe hex as system A, is 63.6%. That um, essentially translates as an energy demand reduction at system A of around about 50, um, 54%. Um, now in new SAP, uh, specifiers can specify the flow rate of the shower and with wastewater heat recovery, as with any heat exchanger, the slower the flow across the exchanger, um, you will get better heat recovery efficiency. So as you can see here at nine liters per minute, we get 68.1%. That translates more like a 58% energy reduction. Uh, SAP, the PCDB now um, lists uh, flow rates from 13, 11, 9, 7 down to five liters per minute. And the efficiencies 
on that uh, increase quite significantly actually so that it's lower flow rate showers will have a much bigger impact in sap now than was ever able to model previously because it was always defaulted at 11 litres per minute and um, so it's certainly worth considering if you're if you're modelling this. Um, also um, just to qualify the other end of the scale I said the system B is the least efficient well it's not hugely less efficient when you look at it here so we're talking about a, a simple hot water um, reduction per shower use in system B of around 40 to 43 percent at those same uh, flow rates so uh, really is still quite significant in terms of hot water reduction. Um, I will hold there just for a moment just see if there are any questions on that first part and then we'll kind of get into some product detail. One question in the chat, Ellis. Sure. Um, which was from James, which is how is the efficiency impacted across the whole of the shower? It takes a while for recovery to kick in, and at the end of a shower, heat is lost. Uh, yeah, good question. So, um, in in all of our products are third party tested, uh, as are all wastewater heat recovery products in in SAP. Um, third party tested and then that information goes to BRE to be used in the SAP database. Um, on third party testing, in, in most cases, most products will get to steady state in around about 20 seconds. Um, and hopefully Andrew can attest to that as a, as a user of wastewater heat recovery. Um, but so you should get up to steady state in around 20 seconds. Average shower time, probably six to eight minutes for most people. So the majority of the shower use is, is getting the benefit of wastewater heat recovery. Um, obviously, if you are running uh, system A or C back to the boiler and there's long pipe runs, uh, big houses, etc., um, that may impact in terms of uh, real life energy savings. But the reality is most bigger houses would probably be looking at multiple wastewater heat recovery units, probably looking at system B. And we can assist you with that type of design on those outliers. But um, yeah, I would imagine it, it, it would probably be system B installed. So. Um, yeah, it can have impact, but certainly for SAP, um, it doesn't really have an impact in terms of modelling. Hopefully that answers the question okay. Okay, um, so just to focus on some products then, initially just a quick look at the pipe, then the Easy Fit, um, the new uh, Pipe Hex Active uh, and the Drain Plus Compact. Um, so the, the, wherever possible, we will always look to specify um, the vertical pipes. They're the most efficient product um, that we have, and certainly this is one of the most efficient products on the SAP database, but also the most cost effective used in volume by volume house builders. Um, the pipe, uh, the, the heat exchanger itself is a 2.1 meter uh, copper heat exchanger pipe, as you can see here. Normally, um, would, well, they, because it's gravity fed, it needs to install on the floor below the shower it's connected to, and will normally box in next to the SVP. So kind of showing a, a a, a unit here which is taking uh, waste feed from the shower and actually in this uh, example it's taking waste from the bath next door as well or from the shower over bath rather. Um, we managed to get such high efficiencies on, on our vertical products because they use uh, a long heat exchanger pipe so uh, a, a lot of surface area for, um, for contact and also we use copper so uh, high um, transmissibility in terms, in terms of heat exchange um, and also as you notice here on the uh, on the waste input, we have um, our turbo rotator. So this is the standard part of the product on the waste um, side. And all this is there to do is literally it directs the flow of the warm waste coming in so that it spins it and that then forms a kind of cyclonic movement so that that warm waste will then cling to the inside of the copper heat exchanger pipe. Um, it gives us, uh, maximizes surface contact, uh, maximizes heat exchange. So it's a thin film heat exchange. Um, now the unit, as I said, is, is very simple in terms of uh, its design, but just so you can kind of see, sorry, I've lost myself there. Um, so you can see that here, uh, warm waste coming in in yellow, goes around the rotator, that will then fall all the way through the unit. And then that just vents off to the SVP. So we're not um, harvesting the gray water, we're not storing the gray water or the energy or anything, it's pure heat exchange. So as that warm waste comes in, uh, drops down through, cold water main comes, goes around the outside, comes up preheated. So um, with these products, in addition to what's supplied from, from the merchants, so the wastewater heat recovery unit and the installation kit, all that's required um, from a, a specification or installation point of view is a double check valve to uh, ensure um, uh, water regulation compliance, and then an isolation valve on the incoming cold water main, and then for best practice, an isolator valve on the external, just in case the unit ever needs to be 
uh, upgraded or anything in the future. So it really is very simple installation and uh, first fixed installation, certainly for, for most new build housing. Um, it requires very little uh, change to existing design. So what we're showing here is a, a cross section through the um, SVP boxing. So normally SVP boxing would be around about 220 by 220 mil. With wastewater heat recovery attached, it really is another 200 mil in, in one direction. Um, so it really doesn't take up very much in terms of uh, floor space or, or, or real estate. Um, so yeah, very, very easy to introduce into existing homes if they're um, transitioning from current regs into new regs, etc. Um, and then just to give you a, a kind of a cut through of the wastewater heat recovery pipe itself, um, this, as you can see here, is the is a smooth internal part of the copper heat exchanger. So that's where the warm waste flows and clings to. Um, between the exchanger and the PVC, that's where the cold water goes, and then that will pick up the heat exchange through the exchanger. Um, and then the eagle-eyed among you will see that we've got um, what are um, essentially striations running around the uh, diameter of the pipe, and they run the entire length of the pipe. Um, so we've got striations running across the entire length, what this does, it gives us a visible leak detection system. Um, and by having a visible leak detection system, it means that we directly comply with uh, EU and UK water regulations. Um, it's a belt, belts and braces approach uh, to compliance. But what it means in practice is if there was ever a perforation in the uh, heat exchanger, um, the grey water um, would not be able to mix with the potable water because at first fix and on first test, there would be a visible leak out the bottom of the unit and therefore that would be the leak detection system. Now, in practice, I will say we've never had an issue with uh, a perforation of the exchanger and every single product is uh, pressure tested to six bar before it leaves the factory gate. So it's, uh, again, as I said, belts and braces approach, but it does keep us directly compliant with, compliant with UK water rigs. Um, the reality is if we didn't have that visible leak detection, the trap underneath the shower or bath would need to be located downstream of the wastewater heat recovery unit uh, to maintain that compliance. And that obviously causes potential for blocking. Um, it stops the trap doing what the trap's supposed to do and doing the heavy list lifting for debris. It also means that then you need accessibility for the trap and you've then got a, a trap located on the ground floor uh, well away from the bath or shower. So um, it, it, all of our wastewater heat recovery products use double walled heat exchangers and they all directly comply with, with uh, uh, EN 1717. Um, not really too appropriate for here, but all of our products are also stocked and sold by all the main merchants. So we dovetail into uh, existing supply chains very easily. Um, I kind of covered this, but certainly in terms of first fix installation operation, one to two hours of uh, installer time at first fix, only basic uh, tools and materials and knowledge required for wastewater heat recovery. So no uh, MCS accreditation or anything along those lines required. Um, I've mentioned earlier, no plan maintenance, just simple routine cleaning. Um, because we're all RAS approved materials, copper, PVC, we can just, uh, any standard drain cleaners, anything that's uh, domestic, no problem at all. Um, and then also, sorry, no behavioral change. So it works every time that shower is used, as I said earlier. Um, that's the pipe system. Now, as I said, the pipe is absolutely fantastic for new build houses, especially where you, well, wherever you've got first floor showers and above. But obviously where you've got maybe ground floor showers or apartments, the pipe system isn't necessarily always going to be first choice. So we have a range of other products, which are then termed horizontal wastewater heat recovery products, which tend to locate on the same floor as the shower they connect to. So that's the difference. Vertical pipes on the floor below, horizontal products, on the same floor or within the bathroom pod or, or whatever you're designing in. So uh, that's the main difference there. So this is the easy fit. Um, it's designed as a wastewater heat recovery unit, standalone, designed to go directly under a bath. So it will connect to a thermostatic mixer shower over bath. Um, this was our uh, main product for new build apartments where the primary shower generally is a thermostatic mixer shower over bath. So this will cover you know, 80, 90% of most apartments for, for compliance, for sure. Um, as a horizontal system, by, by the nature of design, horizontal systems aren't as efficient as uh, vertical systems. So you notice here, this is around about two thirds the efficiency of the vertical pipe system. Um, but it's still, uh, this is a, a, again, a market leading uh, efficiency uh, product. Um, and it really does have a, a good impact in SAP. So I'll come on to that. Um, designed for apartments, for retrofit, for ground floor showers, 
Um, whilst it is designed specifically for showers over baths, so it will fit under a standard 1700ml um, bath, but also down to a sort of a, a reduced size bath of 1400. Uh, we can also locate, uh, use the unit um, under a shower riser tray, so if it's a suitably sized riser tray of 1400 or more, it can potentially be used there. Um, and as such, um, sorry, uh, very simple, uh, same simple uh, method of, uh, of, of use. So warm shower waste comes in on one side, goes through and then vents off to the SVP. Cold water main comes in the other side. In this case, the exchanger is a kind of a, a flat serpentine exchanger that gives uh, lots of surface area. Um, so that comes all the way through and there's preheated. Um, this is designed so that um, rather than uh, with some products that are on the market where they focus the waste to come into a kind of a, a, a more kind of small hole and then get their surface contact with the exchanger that way, our unit is designed so that the, the waste comes in and it floods out across the base of the pan. Uh, the exchanger, as I said, is flat and it's designed to, to sit about two millimetres above the base of the pan. So when you've got standard shower flow rates running through the unit, um, that water will roll over and turbulate and roll around and go over and under the exchanger, mixing uh, heavily, and then that's how we get high uh, heat exchange on this. Um, but importantly, when the shower or the bath um, finishes running, it then allows any debris that might have come through, anything that the, the trap has let through, um, will then just be able to flow straight through the unit. So we're not, you know, we're designed not to uh, block up, uh, designed completely from the ground up this unit. Um, so it, whilst it doesn't have quite the efficiency of the vertical system, the way that SAP calculates uh, hot water usage in, um, in apartments, it does mean that the um, easy fit can score similarly in SAP as in new build apartments as, as, the, as the vertical bike does in um, new build housing. So it really is still a, a very uh, cost effective product. They're priced very similarly. Um, so that should cover most eventualities in terms of uh, new build housing and, um, and uh, new build apartments. However, there is a trend in apartments and certainly in DDA showers and things for low profile shower trays. So what we've done, we've um, essentially designed uh, an active pump system uh, to leverage the high efficiencies of our, our existing sublisted pipes. So what you're looking at here is uh, the new Pipehex Active or the Active Upgrade Kit, which is essentially an off-the-shelf Saniflow pump. So we've partnered with Saniflow um, because they have a fantastic product, great pedigree, great warranty, great servicing. Um, but what this will do is this pumps up to a newly designed uh, buffer tank, which essentially is, is a, a buffer cylinder with a turbo rotator built into it. And then so by pumping the warm water up into the buffer tank, that will then just release that through the wastewater heat recovery unit as normal and then that will uh, work in exactly the same way as, as the standard pipe does. But what it means in practice then is that the wastewater heat recovery pipe can now locate on the same floor as the shower it's connected to, either located behind a sort of service void or into a service riser, or if you're um, producing bathroom pods then within, within the pod footprint. So it really is a, a neat design uh, in terms of accommodating low profile shower trays or ensuite showers in, in apartments, for example. Um, we've designed this to be uh, a very flexible system. Um, so you can see here just uh, some CAD drawings. So we've got the, the pipe dropping into the, the pump system. The pump will um, has a flow switch, so it will allow uh, a volume of warm water to come in. It will then activate and very rapidly pump up into the buffer tank, and then the buffer tank will release that um, warm water into the unit as, a, as if it was a, a standard shower. What this means in practice is that whilst the pump is a very low wattage pump, it's about 250 watts, uh, in practice the pump will only be active for about a third of the time that the shower is in use, which means overall we get a much lower energy use um, from the pump, uh, so much so that since uh, whilst SAP listing this, uh, BRE have not allocated any um, extra uh, energy for the pump system, so the efficiency of the uh, active system is exactly the same as the high efficiency in, in, in SAP as the passive system. So it really does give a big impact, especially for apartments. Um, but it is designed to be very flexible in terms of design. So I'll just move on a slide there because it might be difficult to see. But um, essentially, we, we can be um, sort of fairly flexible in terms of how this designs in. Um, obviously, you need a fall from the shower trap into the pump. So maybe on a, on a low profile shower, this might need to be recessed slightly into the floor void. 
um, but then it can be within a couple of meters of the pipe and or of the um, of the shower unit now one of the real advantages on that is if I just move back slightly whilst the uh, wastewater heat recovery unit will um, is is still um, fit and forget so um, plan maintenance free um, obviously we're introducing the mechanical component into the system now so that will need to be accessible so um, by having that flexibility of design it means that perhaps the um, the pump can be located into a, a, the a vanity unit void that can be accessible yet the pipe can still be located behind a service riser or, or sorry behind a service void or um, or into a service riser so it does give flexibility there for introducing that mechanical system um, and then just to confirm this is the SAP listing with that same high efficiency uh, especially at low flow rates um, just for completeness, we also have a range of wastewater heat recovery integrated wet room drains. Um, these are uh, recessed wet room drain channels, just as a, a standard linear wet room drain uh, would operate, but this has wastewater heat recovery integrated within it. Um, three different models, three different efficiencies. Generally, the higher efficiency has a slight, slightly deeper um, uh, requirement on it, but these are absolutely great really for um, high shower traffic environments, so um, swimming pool changing rooms, communal banks of showers etc where the ROI can be really really quite incredible actually so higher shower use much lower ROI so um, designed for commercial um, and I'll just pause there sorry that's there's quite a lot of information there but I'll just pause to see if there's anything on the, the products and then we'll go into a bit of compliance and designing uh, the only the only question in chat at this was regarding whether the um, any sort of build up of um soap or films within the horizontal units will affect efficiency which I've, which I've asked in the chat but I don't know if you want to. Okay yeah just just I guess to expand on that then um so the the, the pipe uh, is a 50 millimeter internal diameter smooth copper pipe so it's designed not to collect any debris um generally in practice what happens is um the way people shower is you kind of you soap up and, and lather up and get the dirt off that flows through the unit and then rinse off with with clean water and that tends to rinse the unit going through um, in, in testing, and we've got a number of um, projects where they've got ongoing monitoring. So for instance, there's a student accommodation project um, in Holland that's got a 10 year monitoring. We're about eight years into that. There is no noticeable um, drop off of efficiency over time um, that can be attributed to, to build up biofilms, that sort of thing. Um, we also sometimes get asked about um, hard water areas. We're not in the, in the hard water zone, so there's no evidence over sort of certainly 10 years in the UK and 25 years or so in Holland of any build-up or scaling within the units as well. So hopefully that answers that. Um, uh, point other, sorry, there's one other question that's just come in regarding the active um, was what happens if the pump fails? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah. It, the, the honest answer at the moment is we're still working through that. Um, the reality is as designed there, if the pump fails, the shower would stop working because there's nowhere for the waste to go. Um, however, we are looking at uh, an option, and it would be an optional designing, um, where there's essentially a bypass on the waste, so that if the pump was to stop and it would hit a certain um, sort of volume of water, that would then spill over and straight into the, the drain and bypass the wastewater heat recovery unit. So we're just looking at those designs. I mean, it's, it, realistically, it's not um, kind of to do with the wastewater heat recovery side, it's more to do with part H and drainage and, and, and what those designs look like. So we are working on that, but there are known uh, drainage bypasses for things like baths and high flow showers and, and stuff like that, that that have been used. So we're looking into that at the moment. Um, and certainly if anyone has experience on that sort of thing, we're happy to sort of discuss as well. Thank you. Um, Hi, this, sorry, this, yep. sorry. Well, I, had, well, I had a question. Um, it's, nice, it's good to see you've got a lot of different products for different applications and I'm sure. wondering if you've worked out what the embodied carbon is of your products and yeah, um, so if they have an understanding of what the payback might be in terms of carbon. I've got a couple of slides at the end um, or towards the end of the next section which covers um, uh, embodied carbon but also operational carbon in, in, in uh, sort of modelling as well and residential. So if you can hold the thought I'll, I'll go over that in a moment. Yeah. Sorry, that's just one other question yep. that's come in. It was regarding the um, the accounting for the pump energy on the active unit and how that affects the uh, the efficiency rating of it. Yeah, it does. It doesn't impact on SAP. Um, there is obviously there is an energy use. It's deemed to be so low that it doesn't really impact the energy 
um, savings on the shower. If Again, if you hold that thought, I can show you um, a bit more of a sort of granular detail of the energy savings in a home and we can kind of relate that to, to the energy saving per shower versus the, the pump. So if you can hold that thought, I should be able to illustrate that a bit better in a moment. Um, so why is wastewater heat recovery important and, and why, is, why, why, why is it important for regulation? Well, historically, um, as I'm sure you know, space heating being, being the big, has been the biggest energy user in the home. Historically, around two thirds of energy is normally for space heating, uh, less so for water heating and other uh, uh, applications. Um, but of that for generated hot water, showering tends to be the biggest uh, user of, of hot water. So in new build, ho uh, in, in houses, generally around about 50% of hot water use is attributed to showering. That can be up to about 80% in, in apartments where um, hot water, generated hot water demand is, is used uh, more for showering. Um, and as I said, about 85 to 90% of that energy is going down the drain. So potentially there's a large amount of uh, the home's energy budget potentially going down the drain as wasted energy without wastewater heat recovery. So just as we show here, um, this is based on a sort of average home from about 15 years ago, uh, energy saving trust data. And then when we kind of look at a 50% uh, of hot water and showering and 85% going down the drain, potentially around 10% of the uh, energy budget or the, 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 the boiler uh, energy is going down the drain as, as waste. So it really is a big uh, loss of energy. Um, and as homes are becoming more and more uh, fabric efficient and airtight and uh, efficient in terms of their, their heating and hot water production, um, the relative amount of, of energy used for hot water is just becoming uh, more. And so that relative amount of energy that's being wasted as part of the, the whole budget is, is potentially more as well. So this is just looking at um, a sort of average or a three bedroom home under new regs uh, and the difference. Uh, and whilst the absolute energy may well be the same in terms of the absolute amount of showering and things, the relative amount of waste is, is going up by comparison. So it really is something that um, is, is becoming more and more focused on hot water use and hot water waste, and certainly something that both Part L 2021 and Future Home Standards seem to be considering uh, now. So uh, I'm sure you're all very aware of Future Home Standard, uh, and I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, mainly because the, uh, we haven't gone to the consultation yet, so we don't really know the detail on it. But the expectation is um, a higher um, uh, CO2 emissions for new homes, around about 75%. But the ethos of it, of it, of it is that we're going to be producing homes that are reliant on um, electricity for heating and hot water, so no more fossil fuel reliance. And as such, those homes over time will naturally decarbonize as the grid decarbonizes. So the idea is that new homes built from 2025 onwards will not need to be retrofitted to become net zero over time. And, and that's the main crux of a future home standard. Um, however, hot water is obviously being uh, looked at in more detail on that. And the certainly um, SAP 10 and SAP 11, of which um, our technical director is on the steering group, is seeing that being considered much, much more um, so now. But in the meantime, we have Part L 2021, which are kind of seen, seen as um, stepping stone regulations. And, and the reason is that if we were to move to all electric today, essentially, we quite simply don't have the capacity in the grid. We don't necessarily have the infrastructure in place. And certainly the heating and hot water demand for uh, residential at the moment far outstrips the uh, electrical uh, availability or the, uh, the grid uh, peak demand. Um, the key changes in Part L are looking to uh, address this. So the notional dwelling has uh, improved fabric. Um, thermal bridging is much more prevalent uh, in, in uh, SAP 10.2 uh, now, and PV includes, is included in baseline to um, introduce renewable energy generation and mitigate uh, the, the grid use. Um, but hot water demand, as we've shown, can be significantly reduced by wastewater heat recovery. And it really is one of the really the only technologies that has a really big impact on hot water demand reduction um, rather than looking at more efficient ways of producing hot water. So it really is important in that respect and should be considered almost in the same way as insulation is for, for space heating. Um, as I said, the ethos for future home standard is, uh, is, is net zero over time without any uh, changes. So in part L, where we are now, we're currently in the middle of the one year transition period. Um, and as of June 2023, 
all new build homes in England will need to be um, built to Part L 2021. Uh, and that requires a 31% uh, reduction or increase in CO2 reduction over uh, previous regs. Um, and um, for the first time, wastewater heat recovery has been included in the notion of dwelling. So as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, suddenly the interest in wastewater heat recovery from, uh, from developers and specifiers has, has gone through the roof. Uh, and we're expecting um, uh, lots of use of wastewater heat recovery going forwards. But the notional dwelling is the uh, is BRE's most cost-effective um, recipe for, for new build compliance. And as I'm sure you'll see here, um, what they're suggesting is, as well as a higher efficiency fabric, that gas boilers are still likely to be used, uh, low temperature heating emitters, uh, PV uh, to be used, and then wastewater heat recovery is, is the suggested option here as well. Um, Air source heat pumps certainly are, are um, available and would certainly, um, the addition of, a waste, of an air source heat pump in most uh, new build homes would probably get you to sell through Part L um, without many other changes. I mean, obviously there will be need to be some changes to fabric because the um, fees is, is, is minimum standards, but air source heat pumps do have the ability to almost uh, whitewash or, or, or maybe greenwash across current Part L regs. Uh, regardless of, of other measures and fabric. Um, but the issue, as I said, is, is looking forward, we don't really have the capacity on the grid, but also we don't really have the capacity in the UK for um, wholesale use of air source heat pumps in new build and the amount that's uh, increasing in retrofit, as well as the supply chain and the installation chain. So whilst air source heat pumps are being considered by certain developers and uh, non resi projects and things going forwards, um, it, it, it doesn't have the capacity yet to be used in mainstream. And certainly what we're seeing and what we're hearing from the developers that we're working with is gas boilers are likely to be around about 80 or 90% of their standard house type. So gas boilers certainly expected to dominate uh, going forwards. And that then brings wastewater heat recovery into that uh, mix as part of the most cost effective um, suite of measures to, to get part L compliance for certainly for volume developers. Um, I would say, I mean, because we're looking at and focusing on Part L 2021 here and, and gas boilers are likely to dominate, that tends to be where the focus is for sort of SAP modelling and things. But wastewater heat recovery will work equally well with air source heat pumps. We, you know, demand reduction is demand reduction. It means reduced cylinder size, reduced recharge time, reduce um, uh, 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 hot water recharge time and, and cycling as well. So it really should be considered with, with air source heat pumps as part of a solutions package going forwards. Um, I just pop a slide in here. So this is an extra, um, and it's actually um, one of your colleagues, Lydia Guerrero, um, had a fantastic presentation on, on Part L. Um, and so I've grabbed a couple of slides because um, looking at London plan, whilst London plan essentially hasn't changed, obviously the, the plus 30% for London plan is going to be over and above the new Part L regs, which are increasing by 31%. So Part L, um, sorry, London plan is now going to be a much, much tougher um, compliance target to pass uh, going forward. So just um, sort of drop in the, the case study that Lydia used, which is uh, a Max Vorden project uh, in London, uh, 146 dwellings. Uh, and looking at London plan, this was uh, using uh, heat pumps. I think it was a district heating system with heat pumps, uh, essentially passive house level fabric and sort of fairly standard air tightness. And it was difficult to hit that B lean target of 10%. Um, so uh, what was then looked at was uh, increased U value, increased air tightness, and then the addition of wastewater heat recovery. And that gave uh, the B lean compliance. And uh, hopefully Lydia might even be on the on the presentation. I'd like to catch up later. But um, the 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 um, the, the kind of conclusion of this was that wastewater heat recovery is significant in certainly in compliance for London plan, but also anywhere where there's high hot water usage for, for new build. And hopefully I've, I've got that sentiment right, Lydia. Although um, she did mention that um, there have been some changes in the SAP calculations of London plan. So these numbers might not be entirely accurate now, but I'm sure you guys will have access to this better than I do actually. So uh, I think it's, yeah, it's important there for to look at this um, as, a, as that demand reduction technology that it is. Um, so we're working with a number of volume developers uh, and the reasons that they're looking at wastewater heat recovery is, is realistically because it allows them to continue using gas boilers, uh, known technologies, um, gas, PV, uh, fabric upgrades and things across existing uh, house types. So 
because we've got a fast transition, I mean, a, a year's transition time is, is almost unheard of in terms of building regulation. So uh, a fast transition means that as we move into new regulation, a lot of big sites are going to have to transition plot by plot into, into new regs. And so certainly the use of wastewater heat recovery within that and, and some other um, upgrades allows existing house types and existing plots to be upgraded uh, more efficiently and more cost effectively. Um, and this is kind of the, the Future Homes Hub, which is a, 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 a professional a, a, a industry think tank, have done a lot of work on uh, various house types and how to um, essentially take them from previous regulations with previous fabric uh, cavities, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and look at how you can upgrade um, to, to new build regulations, but almost exclusively across the board, they see wastewater heat recovery as, as, as being important there as part of that mix. So uh, it kind of reinforces the message, I think, quite well. Um, obviously allows for easier infrastructure transition, just to move to all electric on existing developments is going to be difficult. So it does allow for uh, better planning and better transition going forwards. Um, and it's probably important to say, we really are looking at, at, at wastewater heat recovery as an industry. Um, exploding into these regulations with, with the amount of use. But it's worth probably mentioning that, that certainly Recoup have the ability to scale sort of 20, 30 fold and, and cope with the demand and, and maintain our market share. So it, I think it is quite important to, to understand that it's a technology that can scale into, into demand quite well. And we're certainly planning for that. Um, sorry, a bit of a whistle stop through part L regs and how it uh, impacts. Is there any questions on that? I'm, I'm sure there's probably may, way more expertise in the room than, than I have personally. So, but I, I'm, I'm certainly happy to discuss either now or, or later. Um, there's one question about um, installation where there's um, external drainage. Uh, external drainage, generally no problem. External SVPs are an issue. Um, SAP requires wastewater heat recovery to, excuse me, to be located within the thermal envelope of the building. Um, in practice, we don't really see too many external SVPs, but uh, hopefully that answers the question. If not, I'll, I'll hang on and discuss um, afterwards. Um, so just a, a quick bit on designing in wastewater heat recovery and, and, and just a, a, a quick look at a, a, a case stat modeling case study just to kind of try and qualify all of this into what it really looks like in terms of SAP and, and uh, efficiencies. So I think the real takeaway here is that wastewater heat recovery essentially is a very easy technology to design in and in most cases certainly in most cases for new build housing one uh, vertical pipe so the pipe hex installed a system a to the master on suite is normally going to give the biggest uplift and certainly the biggest bang for your buck in terms of a of a, of a sap listed measure um, for apartments two and three bedroom homes as i said one one unit and one wastewater heat recovery unit installed of system A is normally going to be, give the biggest impact. For larger homes, you may, with more showers, you may well require more wastewater heat recovery to, to cover all showers. Um, as I said earlier, that would normally be uh, one unit installed of system A to the primary shower, any secondary units installed of system B, but it can be system, a, system B across the entire dwelling or, or, or project. Um, but uh, if you can consider wastewater heat recovery early, Certainly, uh, in, if you can sort of design in back-to-back -back bathrooms, shower rooms and things like that, it's quite possible to get um, two showers into a single pipe, for example, which obviously reduces costs. So um, if you can kind of consider wastewater heat recovery as early as possible, it, it does mean, and certainly if we're, we're supporting on design, we can sort of offer um, uh, uh, ways to maximise the efficiency and the, and the cost effectiveness of wastewater heat recovery. And we're here to support you. I mean, literally uh, myself, Craig and James, a, a big part of what we do day to day is supporting projects in designing, whether that be houses, group projects or, or, or non-residential. So feel free to lean on us as much as possible. Um, just to kind of show a, a very typical um, design in journey. Um, so we're looking here at a three bedroom home, two bathrooms. Uh, in this case, it's a, a, a thermostatic mixer on the on the ensuite and, and just a bath in the bathroom in, the, in this particular case. But obviously if it had a thermostatic mixer shower of a wastewater heat recovery could be used as well. Um, and as you might have uh, guessed, pipe installed as system A to the master ensuite is, is the big impact. Um, normally, if you were to send floor plans to us or you send sort of group house types that you're working on, we can come back with a tabulated list of wastewater heat recovery options going from biggest impact down to lowest cost. Uh, this particular example is pretty simple, so there's not too much here to, to sort of look at in terms of options. 
But what we will always come back with is specification notes. So as a specifier, you understand why we're suggesting what we're suggesting. Uh, design and installation notes. So these can be tagged potentially to the drawings or in the design pack so that installers and those further down the line, maybe those tendering, understand what's being used and what it's being connected to. And then also the PCDB uh, listing number so that for the SAP assessors in the room, you can literally just pop the, the PCDB number in rather than search through pages and pages of different wasteful heat recovery products and installation methods. So it's just designed to streamline the whole process for you uh, and support you as best we can. Um, hopefully there are some SAP assessors in the room. So just to kind of SAP 10.2 is, is, is I, I guess it's fair to say it's been a bit problematic, but um, certainly for wastewater heat recovery, it seems to be working quite well now. Uh, the one issue that we've seen from specifiers uh, on feedback is that because it's a dynamic system, it's an online system now, um, it tends to um, visually elements can be all in different places um, across the page. So often um, this element here is missed where you add the shower and connect the shower to the wastewater heat recovery unit. So designing in, you would normally choose, for instance, a, a, a wastewater heat recovery system. So in this case, we're checking the box for uh, the primary instantaneous wastewater heat recovery. Um, it would then specify what that product is and the installation method or pop, pop in the PCDB number. Um, then specify how many baths are installed. So that would just be a tick, oh, sorry, not tick box, that's a number. Um, and then this is the important bit, you need to click to connect the showers present with the wastewater heat recovery you've just specified. So by clicking this box, and sometimes it is located further down here, so it might not be on the screen in view, um, that will then give you a pop-up. So you can then um, basically put it, pop in the details, for instance, master ensuite, um, connect the shower with the wastewater heat recovery that you've just specified, um, and also um, specify the flow rate on the shower. So that then you can uh, tailor the energy savings based on flow rate as well, quite well. Um, that will then obviously output a SAP, um, uh, some uh, figures in SAP. So what we're looking at here for this um, particular example with a three bedroom mid terrace, uh, primary energy reduction of 10.7% based on wastewater heat recovery on that one shower. Um, and that translates as a CO2 reduction uh, of 11.1%. Uh, uh, so uh, I will caveat this was in 10.1, but I think uh, it's actually uh, changed. So these figures would be slightly better now, um, but really very impactful, as you can see from just a single pipe into a standard house type. Um, and certainly for sort of uh, three bedroom mid terrace, um, that kind of goes up even more because obviously the, the hot water is a bigger part of that, that energy mix. Um, for bigger homes, the impact can be slightly less, just the way that SAP calculates, but obviously bigger homes are, are more difficult to get through compliance, so wastewater heat recovery is still very important now. Um, that's normally enough for new build in terms of uh, SAP compliance, because realistically we're looking at hitting compliance targets for less installed costs, and that's where wastewater heat recovery um, excels. Um, however, if you do have bigger projects and we can produce tailored um, energy saving calculators, this is just a fairly simple example for, for this uh, new build three bed dwelling, um, uses SAP defaults uh, unless otherwise specified, where are we here? So for instance, six, liters, uh, six minutes per shower, nine liters per minute, these are the current SAP defaults, um, spec uh, specify the product, etc, etc. Um, and then we can output with the energy use. Now, I did mention um, about the energy savings versus the, um, this is based on the pipe system, so the pipe hex. And you can see here, looking at that um, shower, would be saving 1.7 kilowatts of energy per day uh, across a, a three bedroom home. So when you consider that the shower, I'm uh, sorry, that the pump system is probably using on average about 85 watts uh, of energy per shower, um, and that's across the six minutes, so that uh, would be less uh, over the time. It really is quite insignificant in terms of, the, of how much energy the pump's using versus how much energy the wastewater heat recovery system's saving. And so that's why um, BRE and the, and the PCDB database hasn't attributed any energy losses to the active system. So hopefully that answers that question from earlier. Um, just coming on to the embodied carbon element, if I can just draw your attention here to the annual operational savings. So we're looking at 164 kilograms of uh, CO2 saved operationally per year. And then it, that's against a gas boiler and then against an air source heat pump, 131. If we then look at the embodied carbon uh, in our products. So this is um, 
We worked with SIBSI um, uh, and provided data to help them develop their TM65 standard for embodied carbon in residential heating. So we had got quite early visibility on the, um, on the embodied carbon on our uh, pipe hex system. Um, and so we have a very low embodied carbon, um, mainly because we use majority recycled and highly recycled recyclable um, primary materials in it, so mainly being copper, but also PVC that's um, completely recyclable. Um, we also have a circular uh, manufacturing um, process where we are able to buy back end of life products, uh, recycle the exchanges, recycle the uh, PVC components, and also, so that's end of life, um, but also actively at the moment, we will offer um, uh, a recycling scheme for um, perhaps like uh, transport damage products, or if installers drop a product a bit too hard on the concrete floor and that comes back to us with a crack, we can remanufacture that because inevitably the exchanger isn't damaged so we can reuse those exchanges. Um, so yes, we have a, a highly um, circular manufacturing uh, ethos within the company. Um, and as you can see here, or hopefully you can see because it's quite small, our um, calculated uh, TM65 number for the pipe is 59.63 kilograms of CO2 per pipe product. So when we look at that back against the operational savings, which we just mentioned there on that three bedroom home, really the embodied carbon number is very, very low considering the A, annual embodied uh, operational carbon savings, but also the fact that these products have a 40 to 60 year lifespan. It really is very, very low. And so from an embodied carbon uh, ratio to operational carbon savings, it really is very, very, very low. Um, just for completeness, just to kind of um, a, a quick di design through on apartments, this is relatively simple as you might expect. If you've got showers over baths, generally the easy fit installed as either, syst either system A or possibly system B is going to be um, probably the, the, the primary wastewater heat recovery. Um, for any en-suites, you may well consider the pipe hex for apartments. Um, that could potentially be system A because that would give the biggest uh, uplift in SAP if you've got the pipe as system A, um, but it could also be system B. Uh, and, and certainly if you've got both, they may, they may be system A or system B mix. Um, and that's as far as I'll go with that. Is there any, any questions on that part? And I'll just come into a couple of case studies. So I'm aware we're really running close to time. Okay, I'll, I'll just push through and then if there's any questions we can... No, just there's just a question on uh, the Legionella side of things. Ellis, don't I'll, I'll cover that at the end if that's all right, okay. and then we'll get through the case really quickly. So, um, Recoup have been installing and, and working with um, developers for 10, 11, 12, 10, 10, 10 years now in the UK since 2012. Um, sorry, 11 years now in the UK since 2012. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to be a uh, sole supplier to Barrett, um, UK's biggest house builder since 2013. Um, so, we've got a great partnership with Barrett. And what's really interesting with Barrett. Um, is that they are looking to use wastewater heat recovery both across a standard spec across their Part L2021 into future homes is their, their plan and also they're using wastewater heat recovery on their uh, Z house concept which is uh, the one we're showing here and you've probably seen quite a lot of uh, press recently for the Energy House 2.0 which is essentially this product um, net zero um, Barrett house type in uh, a, an environment which can be completely controlled in terms of weather minus 40 up to minus uh, sorry plus 40 um, and wastewater heat recovery our wastewater heat recovery is is included on both of those which is uh, really good to see uh, and it certainly shows the that's kind of forward thinking um, from Barrett on that respect so the Z house that we're showing here is uh, is essentially Barrett's um, window to the future for their homes. Uh, it's, it's a standard house type, standard three bedroom house type that they're producing now, but it's loaded with um, energy efficiency, sustainability and biodiversity technologies that are available in the market now. So this is a home that could be built cost effectively now, and that's their aim with this, with this product. Um, so uses air source heat pump for heating hot water, but other technologies included as well. Uh, low flow rate showers, um, but also wastewater heat recovery are covering those showers. So as you can see here, this is where the wastewater heat recovery is located. Unfortunately, because it's behind the boxing, we tend not to get as much press as we would like because most people visiting don't see the wastewater heat recovery. However, as I showed from the slide earlier, it is there and it is connected to both the ensuite shower um, with a low flow Kelder um, shower, about five liters per minute, and uh, a shower over bath with a standard 
uh, flow restrictor, I think at six liters per minute on this one. So wastewater heat recovery there, reducing that hot water energy demand as a primary energy demand uh, and working well with the air source heat pumps. And as you can see, in terms of designing in, really takes up very little floor space. Um, I'm going to whiz from that, because I'm uh, sure we're just going over time now, just to an, another Max Fordham uh, uh, case study. This is Cranmer Road in Cambridge, where um, our wastewater heat recovery was designed in um, as part of a passive house, uh, well, certainly a, a, a passive house project that would look into reduce uh, energy demand and essentially simplify uh, the hot water um, production and, and, and lower the uh, excess heat from uh, hot water pipe works and things running through. So what they used here, they utilized the uh, pipe uh, hex on the first floor showers and above located in service risers on the ground floor and then the easy fit on the ground floor showers, which I'll show you how that's been done in a moment. Um, essentially local instantaneous hot water, electric hot water production per room. Um, and so the wastewater heat recovery is uh, connected as system A per room, maximizing uh, the efficiency. Um, within those bathroom, um, within the um, uh, uh, showers on the first floor, back-to-back -back showers, uh, my understanding is that they're running into a single pipe. So we're getting two, two showers into one to minimize the amount of wastewater heat recovery uh, cost on site. Um, but then also uniquely for this, um, the bathroom pods or the bathroom pod manufacturer tap lanes uh, were only specified to use uh, uh, 900 by 900 shower trays. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we normally require about 1400 for the easy fit to fit under. So these um, cubicles were specifically designed so that the wastewater heat recovery could bridge out uh, under the cubicle. And this actually locates under a false floor in the uh, utility cupboard um, next to the, the bathroom. So uh, my understanding is that the hot water plant is then located above this unit. And these are then fully accessible, but also can be used with the existing pod showers that were manufactured. Um, there is ongoing monitoring with this project. I, I must admit, I've only um, seen the Passive House um, award submission data, and I think it was kind of held short because of COVID. But um, what was really interesting on this, I thought, other than the, the, the energy reduction numbers, is that um, uh, PHPP, so modeling uh, on the Passive House, assumes five minute shower duration. However, the hot water usage uh, as monitored was showing uh, more hot water use than expected. Uh, and the assumption here is that, um, that it, is that showers are, uh, the, the length of time for the showers is longer than the, what was modeled in PHPP. This is certainly would seem to be similar for um, SAP as well, which is a six minute um, shower time. So I think whilst the hot water use is more than expected and more than modeled, um, the takeaway here is without wastewater heat recovery, it would be much more than expected. So I think the, the wastewater heat recovery is really doing the job here. Um, but if anyone has further info on this project, I'd really like to dig into it a bit more. So i um, happy to stay on for a bit longer. And seeing as we're out of time, I will hold that there just to say we have lots of resource online. Um, but more importantly, I will send you um, a link with uh, copies of the slides, with a, a copy of the recording, but also a link here. If you um, fill in the CB CPD form, um, it will issue your CPD certificate, but also will donate 25 trees for everyone that's filled in, in lieu of the normal sandwich that you would get with a lunch and learn. So um, helps everybody helps everybody on the sustainability journey. And I will hold it right there. Thank you very much. Right, Alice. Sorry, I knew that was going to be tight with with other case studies. Yeah, in, but... it's, it's not, it's not too Hopefully I haven't lost too many people. Um, and I think there's lots of really interesting information there and um, really well presented and really nice to see that you went to all that effort of putting our, some of our projects in there as case studies. It was really, really nice. And I think good stuff. Good, good, good. Um, I think said there was that Legionella, uh, something asked the Legionella. Ah, yes. Uh, sorry. Yes. Um, so on, on, on the Legionella front, all of our products, all installation methods are all Legionella risk assessed and all deemed lowest possible risk. Um, as I'm sure the um, public health engineers in the room will know whenever you put something in for Legionella testing, it will never come back as zero risk. Lowest possible risk is the lowest you can get. Um, so as long as the wastewater heat recovery has been installed as per manufacturer instructions, um, there is no extra risk uh, for Legionella for a shower with wastewater heat recovery versus a shower without. 
that kind of covers off the residential side. And in practice, it's, it's quite difficult to go outside of those parameters in a standard residential design. Um, the, the, the parameters that impact it are, the wastewater heat recovery unit shouldn't be insulated. So um, this really is relevant only to the pipe systems um, because you wouldn't norm, uh, you know, other, other units don't, aren't really insulatable. But if the pipe's located in the SVP boxing and the SVP itself is insulated, the pipe should be less left open. The idea being when that, that hot water source or the heat source uh, drains away, so the shower stops being used, warm shower water, that's our only heat source, just falls through the unit. Uh, the, the, the wastewater heat recovery unit needs to cool down as quickly as possible. So don't insulate the pipe. And then the second caveat is that the length of pipe on the system B pipe work from, so the preheat running from the wastewater heat recovery unit to the cold side of the shower mixer needs to be under 4.75 meters in uh, 15 mil copper. Now in practice, it's difficult to design a residential system where that's longer because of the natural falls on the outgoing waste tend to mean that the pipe's located about three meters away maximum. So uh, for residential, it's, it's never normally an issue, but for non-residential scenarios, it might be a consideration. We can you know, work with you on that. So if you've got projects that, that are looking at wastewater heat recovery and, and it's a question, just send it across and we, we can help you. But we do have um, that, that uh, risk assessment is available so we can send that across and, and you guys can work through that as well. But yeah, essentially, no extra risk is is the is the quick answer to that. That that'd be great. Is that is, is that sort of some sort of independent assessment? That we can yeah. So so um, Legionella control are an independent body for testing for Legionella risk assessments. So uh, very early on, we had all of our products and all installation methods uh, risk assessed. So I, I can send the link across to that uh, directly. Is, is that James asking the question? Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. We'll, we'll, then, we'll send that across directly, James. And then the, I think the housing associations that we do a lot of work with are interested in the vertical system. They are sort of, historically, they've been not keen at all to have um, anybody's equipment or relating to equipment in the sort of from the dwelling above in the in the void for the for the dwelling below. Are, do, are you aware of any um, anybody who's taken that? Sort of um, so, I mean, if the standard houses, then generally it doesn't matter. But obviously, if you've got flats, um, flatted developments, muse apartments, that sort of thing, they can be. Oh, sorry, muse muse houses. Um, they they that can be problematic. Um, that's why we have the horizontal system. So um, certainly a lot of social housing that we see, uh, primary shower is thermostatic mix of shower over bath. And so the easy fit lends very, very well to that. Um, so uh, the easy fit is a very easy option, locates in that unused void space under the bath. So it doesn't have any issues in terms of ownership. Um, we do obviously now have the, the, the pipe hex active as well, which would um, be usable there. Um, so yeah, so uh, that they are all options. Um, we do see uh, not so much housing associations, but build to rent schemes where the ownership of the building will remain uh, owned, uh, wholly owned by uh, an operator. Um, that tends to be very similar to student accommodation and hotels where you can potentially locate the pipe in the service risers. So again, build to rent being a bit more of a sort of replicatable footprint floor on the floor around centralized service rises a bit like hotels and student accommodation that may well be an option there to use the pipe um, in that type of uh, apartment scenario but usually for apartments for retail sale we would suggest that the pipe isn't necessarily the best option unless there are communally accessible service rises that's really where it sits um, but the good thing about having access uh, pipes in service risers, especially if you're back-to-back um, -back showers, is you can get two into one, and it really does improve the um, the ROI of the scheme on, a, on a, an already good ROI in most cases. Um, Mr. David, got a question? Yeah, I just have a follow-up on the the Legionella side you mentioned in terms of lack of insulation. Um, does that cause any acoustic issues, or is the and is the is the pump particularly noisy? Um, so often we end up insulating the drainage more for acoustic. Yeah. So um, yeah, correct. So so the SVP 
uh, insulation generally is acoustic insulation, correct? Um, no, so the, the pipe by design, um, because the turbo rotator is doing its job and the, the wastewater's clinging to the inside of the pipe, it's then falling down essentially onto a 90 degree bend and then off to the SVP. It really shouldn't add much noise at all. And in practice, you know, we've never had an issue with noise with the wastewater heat recovery units being installed. Um, if we didn't have a double walled heat exchanger and the trap was moved from above to below, you do have the potential for falling water noise into the trap, depending on the style of trap. So um, recoup products don't have that issue because of the double walled exchanger. So on the passive pipe, no, there shouldn't be noise. On the easy fit, no noise. On the drain systems, no noise. Um, for the active pump system, um, because we're using a Saniflow pump and it's off the shelf, there's, it, the noise is a known quantity. It, it has a known decibel level um, and that's you know in the market. So um, top of my head, I don't know what that is. I recall it being low, um, but I can't tell you what the number is, but we can send you the details over. Um, you know, they, they're, they're designed and they're used in, in um, schemes all over the place. So it, sh it shouldn't be an issue, um, but yeah, I, 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 it shouldn't be an issue. Thanks. Obviously, just just of my personal experience, you, it's the you know imagine the flow rate of flushing a toilet compared to having a having a shower, and it's the you know it's it's the it's the flushing the toilet flow rates that are causing the the acoustic issues, whereas the the you know the, the shower is just a a gentle trickle in comparison. Yeah. So I've never. Yeah. Um, good. One other question. Yeah. Uh, just regarding drain cleaners, corrosive drain cleaners. Um, as, as, essentially, as long as they're domestic drain cleaners, then there shouldn't be an issue. Um, the, the products ha are copper, um, so all copper heat exchangers. Um, the drain products are stainless steel body. Uh, the easy fit is recycled ABS and the uh, pipe hex is um, PVC. Uh, all of those are RAS certified um, components, so there shouldn't be an issue from a domestic drain cleaner point of view. Um, there will be a list of you know chemicals that, that shouldn't be used in domestic drains, so we just follow that guidance. Anything else? I'm, I, I'm happy to sort of close off there because I know we're, we're kind of running past the hour, but I will also stay on as well if anybody has any further questions. I do also have a couple of non-resi case studies just loaded up in the background if anybody wants to go through or look at anything more specific. So. Um, I will hand back over to you, Andrew, if that's okay, and I'll patiently wait just to see if anybody stays on. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think that was good, and I think yeah, probably we've got a few, a few minutes over, so we probably do want to, to to call it a day. But I guess we'll have your slides, so we'll have the um, we'll, we'll load all that up on the wiki, so that if anyone wants to um, look further on and, and have a look at those case studies, then they, they, they can do. Um, and we'll also post this up with your um, with your contact details. Great well. stuff. Absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you everybody for your attention. It's been a, a very well attended presentation. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much.